Good morning, men. Well, um, we are walking through uh, a, a long series uh, that, that is basically building a biblical worldview. That's a lifelong process, but we're using the, the basic framework called the Ten Commandments because it's God's moral law that he created around a moral universe. And so when we walk in accordance with the way he designed it, things will go better for us. And we're not doing this as legalists. We're doing it as seekers to say, how is life meant to be lived? And in what ways could I get more in line with the way God designed it? So we're all the way up to the fourth commandment now. And uh, it's talking about the Sabbath. And I was uh, talking about the Sabbath last Wednesday night at our other Ironworks group. And uh, one of the guys that was sharing, one of my friends was sharing with me, you know, I've, I've never even thought about it. it. It never crossed my mind. I've been to Bethel College. I've been in church all my life. I've really never given any serious thought to how does the Sabbath apply to me. And so that's why we're having this discussion. And we'll have several weeks on this and uh, try to find our way through this in a way that is winsome and life-giving and not just choking and legalistic, because that's the way it could very easily seem. But, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons we haven't thought about the Sabbath very much is because we've all grown up with labor laws. We've, we've grown up with OSHA. We've grown up with vacations. We've grown up with weekends and a leisure culture. So we've, we've not thought about the Sabbath in terms so much maybe of rest, but we also haven't thought about it as unto the Lord. So here's what it says in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. That's the phrase that's capturing me. In what way am I making this to the Lord? Not just to rest Roger but something that gives me time with the Lord. Well, in the beginning, God created limits. <laughs> he was infinite. There was no time. It was, there, was no, there was no universe. There was nothing. It was formless and void. And God came and separated the light from the dark. He separated the, the land from the water. He separated the, the different plant species, the animals, and ultimately made human beings. God was making out of infinity material things that all have boundaries and limits, and that includes on our time. And everybody's different. There's whole different energy levels in this room. Uh, some of you claim you only need four hours of sleep a night. Uh, others of you say, no, I, I got to have nine, you know. Some people run like the Energizer Bunny, and we just wonder, where in the world do you get that capacity? And isn't it amazing, really, how God motivates people, how God builds into them energy for what they do. And then for me, it would just wear me out if I did it for a half an hour. So we're all different. We all have different temperaments, different capacities. We all have different levels of physical strength and energy and endurance. But on the other hand, we're all the same. We're all human. We all have limits. And we need to recognize that. And God, our Father, knows that. The, the Lord who made us knows that we have limits. And the Sabbath is a reminder that dominion is not all there is, men. That relationship is also a part of the image of God in us. Relationship with Him that then flows to others. And when we don't feed that side of our lives, things begin to dry up. So I want to talk about things quickly this morning, just to tweak you a little bit, but I want to be careful that we don't turn this into a series about techniques and tips and tweaks and, and tricks, you know, to manage our time. We do need some management tools, and those will be helpful. But I want to make this more and more about our heart. Where's my heart? What am I drawn to? And what fulfills me? So here are six things. Maybe one of these or two of these, it's hard for you to say no. You know, good is the enemy of the best. So let's just kind of walk through this. Maybe I can't say no to progress and technology. Um, I just got an iPhone uh, a couple months ago, and it, it will tell me how much screen time I've been using. And uh, that's shocking. 
you know, how much time that is. Uh, but I can't say no to technology and progress and time-saving things. And, of course, we know the irony. None of this has saved us any time at all. Uh, we're busier than ever. I can't say no to accessibility. I feel like I need to be available. I, uh, do you ever drive anywhere in silence? Do you, do you turn off the chirps on your phone? Uh, do you turn it off and refuse to answer it during dinner time or certain times of the day where you just, I'm not going to be accessible. I don't have to be that accessible. I can't say no to multitasking. I'm always trying to do two things at once and uh, neither one of them turns out to be <laughs> done very well. I can't say no to leisure and sports. I'm always wanting to do the next thing, get the next toy, go, on the, go over the next horizon. Um, and the question for that is, do these things refresh me or do they drain me? I've been asking that question for about the last 20 years. What is it that drains me? Some of that's necessary because it's called work. <laughs> and, and it is hard. It's labor. And that's okay. Six days you shall labor. But what really refreshes me? A friend of mine says, what are the faucets... And what are the drains? And sometimes it's hard for us to recognize that. And it's really hard to recognize that when we're supposed to be planning something that's fun. And then it becomes like the Normandy landing. And with all this equipment, all this time, all this planning, and it ends up being a drain. I think that's uh, something we need to look at. And we really need to look at it with our children and our grandchildren, our youth culture. The fear of missing out, FOMO. <laughs> you know, I have one daughter who used to go to bed at night and, and she couldn't go to sleep until she knew what she was going to do tomorrow. She was scared to death that she would be bored. And <laughs> some of us have, have uh, instead we have phoba, fear of being asked, <laughs> us introverts. <laughs> Or maybe you have a fear of all the, or you have, you can't say no to all the choices uh, that you have. And uh, years ago, David Maines had a series called The Chapel of the Air on radio. And uh, he had a series called Making Sunday Special. And it was when our, our daughters were still malleable and a young age. And uh, we began to say, let's, let's limit our choices on Saturday night and let's begin uh, a kind of a sab Sabbatarian practice. You know, in the Old Testament, Sabbath began on Friday evening at about 5 o'clock. So the, the first part of the Sabbath was to go to bed. Does that help you keep a Sabbath? <laughs> to realize that if you start in the evening and you make the evening kind of a family time and then you sleep, that's the first part of your Sabbath, and then it goes through the next day at about 5 o'clock. Well, we used to start on Saturday night, laying out the clothes and getting ready for church and, uh, and, and making, trying to make Sunday special and have a rhythm to that. And uh, many of us still have that option to do that, to rise, to have a quiet time, to, uh, to get here early, to be a part of the family of God. Well, here's some Sabbath practices, and we'll be coming back to these, but I just want to mention them briefly. We need to find a new full, a new full for our calendars, to be able to say there's a there's a, 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 a stall indicator that goes on when I get too full. Uh, years ago, my wife Joanne began to reduce the sugar content of our desserts, of cakes and cookies and things like that. And she gradually reduced that until now, if, if I go over to Byerly's and buy a cookie or a cinnamon roll at Byerly's, it's too sweet for me. Uh, I'm not judging anybody here. <laughs> I'm just saying it, it's amazing it, the, level, the level that we, that we have this hunger for. And, and we seldom think, could, could I reduce this and find a different full for my schedule? A different level of sweetness, a different level of satisfaction. And we often don't recognize it. So um, that we need to distinguish between wanting something and wishing for it. If you want something, you're putting energy into it, and it's, it's worthwhile. That's my definition of wanting. But if we're wishing, it means we just, we just can't stop the sugar high, uh, whatever that is, whether it's actually food or whether it's our schedule. Psalm 37.4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. And sometimes we don't know our desires. And uh, it's because we're just too busy. The second one is to cease. The Sabbath means to cease. And we prioritize worship. It's unto the Lord. It's to delight in the Lord. Here's what uh, Isaiah said to the children of Israel. In uh, Isaiah 58, 13. If you turn your back, or if you, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. His whole desire is not, hey, stop, don't have any fun, be quiet, squelch yourself. His whole idea is take delight in the Lord. Stop long enough to recognize there's more to life than just the things that we're doing and accomplishing. So we need to just cease. Because I think that the core issue of the Sabbath is trust. Do I trust him that if I obey him in this, he will not only give me what I desire, but he will also accomplish and take care of my family the way I, I have tried to do myself. Thirdly, establish an aerobic rhythm. Do you know what the word aerobic is? Aerobic means with oxygen. So if you're walking aerobically, it means you're, you're walking so that the supply of oxygen you're using is being resupplied by the way you're breathing. Anaerobic means without oxygen, and that's when you hit the wall. <laughs> so establish an aerobic rhythm that suits you, your wife, your family, your rhythm. That's complicated because many people work Weird schedules, different schedules, rotating schedules. There are two, two people working in the home, and there's different schedules we have to do. But there can be some kind of a rhythm unique to you that is somewhat repetitive so that you can remember, hey, I'm coming up on a season when I can step back and cease and relax and, and do this unto the Lord. Um, so these are some basic Sabbath principles and habits but nothing helps us like an example or an opportunity to see how is this doable? How do we do this? So I'm going to ask Joe Myers to come and uh, talk to us about uh, something that's happening in his life, the life of his wife and family. And uh, he just mentioned it to me a while back, and I think it'll help us think how weird he really is <laughs> to be doing this and, ask, and force us to ask ourselves the question, uh, is this doable for me? So, Joe, tell me, we had a little short conversation. You read a book. What was that book? Uh, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by a uh, pastor, John Mark Comer. And it was a life-changing book. Come on over here because um, Dean is going to... Oh, yeah. Dean, Dean, Dean will get you. <laughs> um, so it was recommended by, uh, by a friend um, who is sort of embarking on a new lifestyle in the RV world, and they recommended it for us um, to start our journey. Um, and me and my wife listened to it and read it in about a day, and sort of uh. the, light, the light came on, and we started to change and adjust based on the, the impact and the, and the learnings from the book. So what, what, what convicted you right away? Uh, that love and that God and hurry cannot be in the same sentence. <laughs> okay. You can't be loving mm. and hurried at the same time. I think we've all experienced that. An example used in the book is trying to get your type A wife and three kids out of the house when you're running late. Yeah. <laughs> like for me, that, that, that hit home. Like I... Yeah. We want to be on time. We want to be respectful. That's why we're taught, like, show up on time. Late is bad. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, rushing with my kids and raising my voice with my kids because we're five minutes late for church. Yeah. Always felt like a disconnect. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know how to stop it. Yeah. Um, and the, so that practice of reducing the hurry, reducing that um, has been mm -hmm. monumental in my life and how I treat my kids and wife and work. And it's been fantastic. So what are the boundaries that you're bumping up against? Or what are the new, the new uh, things you're putting into your life to help with this? I think that's the, the, it's the opposite. It's not what I'm putting in. It's what I'm taking out. Okay. So it's removing those 
distractions. It's removing my phone. It's removing watching Netflix at night. Um, it's removing a lot of things. It's removing being multitasking. I was, I'm a, a generation that was grown in the digital age. If I'm not multitasking, I'm not active. I used to be a chef. If you're not multitasking, you're not working or you don't have a job. So my entire life was multitasking and people said they were bad at it. I just thought they were like less than, very honestly. I was like, oh, you can't multitask? You're not like me. I can, I can multitask. I can do this. You yeah. can't. Yeah. I, I, I can't multitask. Hmm. Um, I grew up in the digital age. You know, Facebook was born when I was in college. Like it was yeah. the language of me as being on multiple different browsers, multiple different screens, my phone, I have two monitors at work, my phone, things in the background, and I was horrible at it. So I eliminated multitasking, and now I'm three, four times more productive at work hmm. because I'm focusing on one thing. I don't start six fires, put it out, put it out, put it out, put it out. And this week I've been doing that, and by Wednesday afternoon, I was like done with all of the things that have taken me more hours huh. to accomplish because I've focused and eliminated those outside distractions, and it's been fantastic. Well, there must have been some withdrawal from that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, you strike me as a high-energy guy when yeah. you say you're multitasking. I get that. Yeah. For you. I, I can see that in you. Very, very so, much so. I, I didn't believe it, honestly. Yeah. I, I've read probably 10, 15 productive books, productivity <laughs> books about don't multitask. Um, I don't remember any time in the Bible where Jesus was multitasking, so there's an example there. Um, but I, you know, once, once, it, once it was... Once it was reduced, I felt I was missing something. Mm. And then seeing the fruit of the, that labor and being like, oh, wow, I don't, I don't need to do 19 things because I was actually doing none of them. Mm. I was just pretending to do them all. So, I mean, you have a wife and two children. I do. So <laughs> how did you impose this on them? <laughs> uh, nev never imposing, <laughs> never imposing. So the book was recommended to both of us. Yeah. So my wife's heart was kind of turned at the same time I was. Yeah. I think without that there would have been some friction. Mm. So if you, if you implement this and you're married, I'd recommend you have your wife at least <laughs> watch these sermons because that would definitely, we're both very productive and busy lives and corporate lives. And so mm -hmm. um, once our heart was turned to the fact that you can't be godly and hurried at the same time, mm. um, our world changed. I had experience, I, I got off the air, I got off the, on a, an airplane right after I read the book and I would typically, as most of us would be, on my phone in my own world. And I turned off the phone, relaxed, just looked around. And you know, immediately, this lady was in the middle of traffic, dropped her purse, needed somebody to be there. And I was the only one not in my phone. <laughs> Ran up, grabbed the purse, grabbed the lady, had a conversation, was able to serve her, was able to be godly to her. She moved on. If that was me a week prior, I'd been in my phone, checking Facebook, checking email, being productive, hmm. being effective, hmm. being what the world has told me I need to be in those moments hmm. is in my phone. Yeah. But that's not what the word is. Is there anything that you have eliminated cold turkey? Hmm. Or cold turkey. Um, coffee. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> not, <clears throat> not yet. Um, the, the, the one thing is I would, I would watch a lot of videos. I'm a digital marketer by trade, and yeah. so reading up on things and watching videos while I'm doing something else mm. was just my go-to. I'd be like bored if I was not doing mm. three things. So I've definitely eliminated that part of it is like, if I'm going to watch something on my phone, which I still do and still enjoy that, mm -hmm. that's all I do. Sit and watch. And I've enjoyed it and appreciated it, and I'm more selective as well. Mm because I'm not watching everything. Yeah. I'm only watching you know, a five minute clip and I appreciate that and I enjoy that clip and I don't feel guilt about watching it and then I move on with my day. Did you have a fear that you would be bored? Oh yes, yeah. So in the book, they they, he recommends a Sabbath and mm -hmm. I was like, nope, <laughs> nope, not for me. It's like everywhere in the Bible, but that's not for me. That's for somebody else. Um, and so I was like sitting around being, you know, in a Zen garden for the entire day is not me. Yeah. That's not what the Sabbath is yeah, at right. all. That's not what yeah. this is at all. It's a gift from God, not a burden mm. from him. Mm. And I think 
returning that and discovering that, and we did our, our first ala- official la- Sabbath last oh. Sunday, and it was the best day of my week. So what does that look like for you and your family? I mean, I know this is going to be experimental. Yeah, yeah. But what did, what did, how did you go about the first one? So we, we, we planned it out, made sure we knew what we were hap- doing, and so we got up. We all slept in. I have a two-year-old, and the night before, my wife goes, what happens if our two-year-old gets up at 5.30, like they do? We usually turn on the TV. So we said, God, we're not going to turn it on. If he gets up at 4, 5.30, 6, or 8. Um, and he slept in till 8.30. First time, <laughs> almost ever. Lord, send me a sign. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was one of those small things like, okay, we'll be faithful. So we got up. We had a leisurely brunch. Uh, we came to church. Was able to hear the word. Um, we came home. We rested. My wife baked. I played hockey with my son. We spent time with friends. We had family over for dinner. Um, we read, we played games, we enjoyed, we did Bible study. It was a fantastically mm. slow and full day. Mm. Um, we turned our phones off. Okay. Um, because it was our first one and we're technology obsessed, we gave ourselves two breaks in the day. I didn't take my second break from my phone. <laughs> I took my first one, looked at it, and it was an empty promise of fulfillment. Hmm. All those notifications, all those bells, all those emails that promise to fill our lives with some sense of um, accomplishment were empty as compared to like being in time with the war- hmm. word, being in time with Lord, being in time with my family, being able to hmm. connect with my son. Um, and it was definitely a reset and we're looking forward to our hmm. you know, Sabbath continuing on. Wow. Do you guys have any questions for Joe? Will he give us a report six months from now? Is he on the I yeah. hope so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I certainly hope so. I think it's one of those spiritual practices that, to be very honest to the church, has failed believers. Mm-hmm. How many times is it mentioned in the Bible, you know, from Genesis to <laughs> clearly the end of the Sabbath? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't want to call anybody out, but that was my first one mm-hmm. last Sunday. Mm-hmm. been a believer since I was mid-20s. That's a decade or more. I hear, hear, hear people do it, see people doing it, and just thought like, oh, they, they're overwhelmed. They're stressed out. They've broken, so they need to stop. Yeah. That's how you become whole yeah. um, by stopping. Because to you said before is that mm-hmm. if you don't have a limit, there is no limit. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a limit, the world has a limit. Time, energy. If you have all the money in the world, you don't have all the time in the world. So you're putting a limit. My limit, six days. God gets one. Mm. Did you mention that there's, there's the book, of course, and then there's videos that go along with it? Did you not say that? Are there videos with this? You see? Uh, no, no. I think probably watching Roger's uh, Sabbath. Like this, if you're like, having your wife do it, the book is fantastic. A quick read, nice and easy. We did the audible version and then got the, got the digital version as well. Um, but I would just recommend it for a family because I know how much I like, how much our, our heart turned toward this. And without, without the background, I mean, the Bible should be enough, uh, but it hasn't been for the past decade for me. So this has been a nice switch in that. So yeah. you'll, you'll be working on your aerobic rhythm. <laughs> Very much figuring up. that out, you and Tara and your family, and very much up. Well, what else have you learned? Any any other nuggets you want to share with us? I think for me, it's re reestablishing what success looks like. I'm a young man, and I, I aspire to be like a lot of you in this room. At that, you know, retired. I hear your guys' stories around breakfast, and I'm like, well, if, if I work really hard, I'll get there. Mm-hmm. But. <clears throat> The journey is where, is where I'm at. The destination's in God's hands. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that becomes a different of like, you know, I want a bigger truck and a bigger car and a bigger house and a bigger business, but those are all in God's hands. Mm-hmm. And if I live by, by his, by his, like God, the God of the universe rested and delighted. Mm-hmm. And I told myself, I don't have time. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus himself would rest and delight. Yeah. He would not be in hurry. If we aspire to be like him, everything else will sort of work out. And it, you know, sort of like the example with my son and 
you know, watching cartoons in the morning on a Sunday morning has been amplified in five or six different elements of my life where I've said, God, this is your day. Hmm. And you've been fruitful in those other areas. And so it's been a, just a fantastic lesson for me of like, oh, maybe the you know, trust in the word and God's will will, will work out and my heart will be turned. Amen. Now, <clears throat> you're self-employed, right? I am. So it's both the best and the worst of the Sabbath. Yes, quite. The worst part is you're never off because mm -hmm. the boss is a tyrant. <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> <laughs> but the good part is you, you don't have anybody telling you you've got to do this and this and this mm -hmm. on a certain day. Yeah, so. I, have, I have clients, and so they're certainly emailing me and respecting that and understanding the understanding of weekends anyway. Well, most of my clients have good ones, so they mm -hmm. respect those weekends. I understand that's not the case for everybody, um, but I think you'll, you'll be surprised how respectful they will be because of who you will be the rest of the six days. They'll yeah. see the fruit of that Sunday in your own life, and one day without you, they'll, they'll survive. Mm. And I had my phone on, and... If something of urgency happened, of course I would be able to respond and do that and be in that moment. I think we all heard that, the story of Jesus in the, in the cart in the, in the ditch. Yeah. And I think that's what my perspective, I took one part of the Bible and said, well, Jesus didn't do the Sabbath because he helped the person in the ditch. Yeah. But that's, mm -hmm. it's taken so out of context mm -hmm. when you think of the rest of the mentions yeah. of it. And so yeah. I think the other thing in the book is I realized how much of my life isn't urgent that I thought was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, if I, don't, if I don't reply to that Twitter message right now, if I don't send that email right now, something horrible will go wrong. And I've realized, like, when I wait, when I slow down, then God goes on. Yeah, and how much of that urgency is building our own brand? Mm -hmm. You know, when I write Joe an email, I know he's going to respond in three minutes, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And, and we, we take, you know, we build our identity by, by that brand. Exactly. Know? Yeah, I'm the guy that, that does mm -hmm. that. Yep, so. I'm, I'm always there. Yeah. I'm always present. But now I feel like my brand is yeah. the, you know, more thoughtful and considerate and, and kind. And that's the brand I want to be besides the <laughs> message me at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'll respond. Yeah, right. Because that, that eventually wears out. Yeah. You eventually run into it <clears throat> and either catch up in your later years or you break Mm -hmm. um, and I want to kind of keep that governor on my life. He mentioned that in the book of like a governor yeah. of like, this is it. And it doesn't, yeah. you know, there's nothing of importance that I have eliminated. I haven't eliminated being a father, a husband, a business owner, you mm. know, starting, a, you know, starting a ministry. Like those things haven't gone away. They've just been prioritized above the things that don't matter. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're going to interview Tara next week. See how she's doing with this. <laughs> please, but please thank, do. Thank you, Joe. You have given us a great example of uh, walking into this and, uh, and giving you something to talk about. So you've got some questions around your tables that uh, you, can, you can talk about. And uh, with Joe's example in the background, let's be serious about what God is teaching us. So enjoy your conversation.